Live from Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zuma Radio, AM 740. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler, hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. The Science of Spirit Possession with Dr. Terence Palmer. He's standing by in England, and he'll join us for the full two hours. My technical producer is Owen Wolf. Live stream producer is Ryan White. However, no live stream this week. The live stream on YouTube returns next week. And the YouTube channel, of course, is Strange Planet. My guest, Dr. Palmer, insists that spirit possession, attachment, poltergeist activity, and the negative impact of obsession, infestation, and harassment on psychological health, together with the methods of dealing with it, are contemporary issues that demand serious scientific research and academic study. Dr. Palmer has a degree in psychology from Canterbury, Christ Church University, and a master's degree in the study of mysticism and religious experience from Kent University. He's been a hypnotherapist for 20 years and a spirit release practitioner for 12 years. His doctorate was awarded by the University of Wales at Bangor for his thesis on the scientific conceptual framework and research methods of 19th century researcher F.W.H. Myers. He is the first practitioner to be awarded a PhD on the topic of spirit release therapy in the United Kingdom. Terence is a member of the Society for Psychical Research and the Scientific and Medical Network and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. He's an active lecturer in encouraging UK institutions to take up the challenge to test the efficacy of spirit release therapy under controlled conditions. His book is The Science of Spirit Possession. Dr. Palmer, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? Extremely well, Richard. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. My pleasure. I read with interest the the title of your your thesis, The Science of Spirit Possession, and I'm I'm trying to imagine how that went when it it came time to defend uh, your thesis. How did that go? For example, because it's such a provocative uh, title, did your professors at the time say, you know, Terence, do you, are you sure you really want to try and tackle this? Well, I must confess that um, traversing uh, the obstacles of academia was not easy. Um, in fact, my thesis was entitled uh, A Revised Epistemology of the, um, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was a very, very difficult academic title, but it's all to do with epistemology, a revised epistemology of the scientific framework of Frederick Myers, who was a 19th century researcher into life after death. Um, The title, The Science of Spirit Possession, was given to the thesis when it was published. Ah, okay. But 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 and but then but then defending it. I mean, I'm just trying to understand how, you know, in academia, this whole subject matter is, uh, is sort of perceived. And I mean, was there a great deal of pushback during your defense of the of the thesis? No, there was a great deal of pushback during the researching and the writing of it. Um, uh, but my supervisor, uh, an extraordinary young um, woman, academic, uh, a Jungian psychologist, was very, very helpful. And she would say to me, listen, Terry, she, she'd say, you've got to learn how to deliver what the academic world wants to hear. So you have to couch your thesis in the language that's familiar to them and you must keep your own ideas to yourself. Mm. I mean, I might be reaching here, but my, at least my perception is, when I think of the academic world, certainly today, is that it is made up largely of, I mean, outside of, you know, theological courses, uh, programs, uh, it would be made up largely of materialists. Yes. Now, I did my research for my doctorate at um, at the University of Wales in Bangor, North Wales, in the department, in the School of Theology and Religious Studies. So my uh, academic peers were, uh, were scholars of theology. 
Um, and uh, the psychology of religion. Um, in other words, they were interested in what people believed about religion. Um, and they weren't, um, I stand to be corrected on this, but this is the view that, that I came away with, that my, my uh, peers in the department were, they certainly didn't believe in a spirit world. They didn't believe in God or devils or demons or anything like that. But they viewed the subject as a, a subject of a social uh, and um, anthropological interest. Right, right. Now, when I think of Great Britain, I think of, you know, such a rich history and, and tradition in the spiritualist movement and so forth. And I'm wondering, because, you know, you've also... Uh, worked in the United States. How do you compare Great Britain's view of this subject matter, spirit possession, spirit attachment, a spirit oppression, with with North America? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, by and large, both countries are very, very skeptical in the mainstream. Um, uh, in the work that I do in working with people who are uh, possessed with spirits and helping to remove them, the, the view of the work that I do in both the USA and the United, um, United Kingdom from the mainstream is that um, the subject is um, supernatural nonsense and has no scientific validity. People who are hearing voices or diagnosed with mental illness are treated with drugs and um, put into the hospital if they're psychotic. And the possibility that the voices they hear are real, coming from an external source, is not considered. And that applies to both countries, to the United States and to, and to the UK. So there's not a great deal of difference there. But when it comes to the people themselves, ordinary people, who are suffering from these afflictions, then there's a growing demand, a growing recognition from people that psychiatry does not have all the answers. You uh, you mentioned uh, Frederick Myers, and in your thesis, obviously, you celebrate his, his work. Uh, yes. Sir Isaac Newton you know, wrote, if I have seen further, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Yes. Um, so I guess Frederick Myers is was sort of that person to you. Tell our listeners about Frederick Myers, his work, and why it's so important. Well, I discovered the work of Frederick Myers when I was studying for my master's degree in the study of mysticism. I needed to understand mystic experience, and I discovered the work of Frederick Myers whilst I was studying for that. Um, and when it came time to find a way through the academic quagmire to do my uh, my doctorate, my um, supervisor suggested Frederick Myers because I was already familiar with his work. Now, he was one of a number of scholars who contributed to the formation of the Society for Psychical Research in London in 1882. He was a Cambridge scholar. And he and uh, his colleagues who formed the society were interested in investigating the scientific validity of what the spiritualists were doing. Uh, spiritualists in the spiritualist churches, and it was very, very fashionable in the United States and in Victorian England, where people became um, very, very interested in communicating with the dead. And there was um, uh, a lot of activity in the theatre. People were presenting stage productions and um, uh, presenting seances. And it became very, very popular across a wide section of society. And Frederick Myers and his colleagues questioned the validity of this scientifically. They wanted to know if it had scientific validity and if it could be supported by scientific investigation. And that was why the society was set up in 1882. Now, Frederick Myers had a particular interest also in the survival of the 
um, of consciousness after physical death. So he spent uh, 20 years investigating, looking at the evidence to support that hypothesis. And for him and for his colleagues and many people at that time, that hypothesis was firmly supported. And his book was published in 1903, and it's entitled uh, The Survival of the Personality Following Bodily Death. Um, and it provides a very, very good scientific foundation to support that hypothesis. Now, what interests me particularly is that in the modern world, his work is largely unknown and ignored by people who do know of it. Hmm. And he, talk to me about his, his one of his principal research tools or his principal research tool was something called magnetism. What is that all about? For magnetism, we go back to um, Franz Mesmer. Uh, you've heard of mesmerism. Yes. Um, the, the German, um, he was a scientist, and he challenged um, a father, Johann Gassner, who was the um, pro proclaimed uh, most powerful exorcist in all of Christendom in, in Europe in the 18th century. And Mesmer came along, challenged him, said, I can do that using a scientific method. And his method he called animal magnetism. And it's this connection, this invisible connection between all living things in the universe and in between people in particular. And he demonstrated this. Uh, this later evolved, was replaced uh, in 1845 uh, by the term hypnosis because there was a, a similarity between the the outcomes of, of the two methods. Mesmerism was uh, this um, transfer of uh, magnetic power between people um, and uh, hypnosis was seen to be the power of suggestion by speaking um, the suggestion to a person. So there's a difference in the technique, but the outcome is very, very similar. So. Frederick Myers was interested in what was this connection between the magnetizer and the magnetized or the therapist and the, the patient. And he went to great lengths to explore its nature. And, and, and Myers' conclusion was that he firmly uh, believed in the reality of, of spirit oppression or possession, correct? Yes, he did. But what I'd like to do is to reinforce the proposition. You, you just used the word belief. Um, and Frederick Myers himself um, would argue about this use of the word belief. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to refer to my own book now. Um, no, you're right. I use that as kind of a shorthand. I mean, he had little time for theology and, and metaphysics, but which is kind of so, centered around belief. But So now for, for the benefit of your listeners, yes. I'm going to read a, a quotation from Frederick Myers. Um, and this is on the opening page of my book. He says, my discussion, I may say at once, will avoid metaphysics as carefully as it will avoid theology. For somewhat similar reasons, I do not desire to introduce the philosophical opinions which have been held by various thinkers in the past, nor myself to speculate on matters lying beyond the possible field of objective proof. Uh, that's a quotation from Myers himself. So what he's saying, really, is that it doesn't matter what you believe or what you think or what your opinion is, and I'm not going to debate any of that. I want to look for the proof to see what is, not what we think is. Right. So he, yes. Yeah, so let me rephrase that. Uh, we'll, re we'll take belief out. He came to the, the conclusion, conclusion. that yeah. in the reality, that, that spirit possession was a reality. Yes. And he only, he didn't, he didn't set out to investigate that. He set out to investigate the scientific evidence to support the hypothesis that um, the spirit or consciousness leaves the body and survives the death of the body. 
And in so doing that, he discovered another um, very, very interesting concept that was being researched by psychiatrists and medicine at the same time, and that is this business of multiple personality, where a person's personality switches um, from one to another. Um, so psychiatry was investigating multiple personality, which is now called dissociative identity disorder. Yes. And, and what Myers um, concluded was that when uh, was that the, the spirit of a person can be replaced by the spirit of another person. So it's very, very difficult to tell the difference between mm. someone who has a multiple personality or an alternate personality and someone who's possessed. Now, when, when he's looking for proof, you see, this is fascinating to me because we're talking about, in essence, an, un, an unseen world. We're talking about, um, uh, you know, discarnate uh, entities. How does one go about uh, f gathering physical evidence for a non-physical phenomenon? Well, that's very tricky. Um, and what science is perpetually trying to do is to provide physical evidence for the non-physical. Extremely difficult. We can only observe the outcome. For example, you, you, can't, you, you can't see microwaves, but you can measure their effect. You can't see radio waves, but you can listen to the effect. There are many, many things in the universe that we can't see at all. In fact, our range of uh, ability to observe is extremely limited. But we have instruments that can measure the effects. And the same applies to spirits. Now, you were talking about your, your discovery of, of Frederick Myers' work. And you were working in the late 90s as a, as a hypnotherapist. Yes. Uh, and, and you... Uh, came across a number of of these uh, cases that just absolutely confounded you, and in yes. fact, were, were, you you described them as being emotionally traumatic. Yes. Uh, um, talk to me about about some of those cases, if you could, that that you first encountered, and and they just could not be explained away using, I guess, more traditional psychological methods. Yes. Um... I'll give you a good example. Um, a woman came to me. Uh, in fact, she was referred to me. But I, I worked with a doctor, uh, with, in, in, a general practitioner, and my consulting room was right next door to his, and he would refer uh, patients to me uh, to see if hypnosis would, would help them. And I also ha had my own patients that would come to see me. And this was one of my own patients, and she, this was a woman who had been suffering from depression for 16 years. And her husband was being driven to his wit's end uh, to the extent that he couldn't live with her any longer. She, he was driving, she was driving him crazy. So he brought her to see me and I um, attempted to investigate the cause of her depression. And the methods that I used were very, very simple. But what it required was for the person to go into an altered state of consciousness, to tap into their inner self, their inner emotions, and, and reveal what the cause of the problem was. I, I couldn't get this woman to do that at all. Um, and uh, I was running out of ideas of how I could reach within. Um, and then I just had an inspired thought. She had told me that... Um, 16 years earlier, she had um, given birth to a, a dead child. She'd had a stillbirth, okay? And this created the depression, and she's not been able to escape it for the past 16 years, which, you know, is really a long time to hold on to grief, uh, irrespective of the circumstances. And this intrigued me, so I said to her, uh, grasping at straws, I said... Um, I asked a question that has an obvious answer, really. I said, how did you feel at the time of the stillbirth? Uh, and it was then her reaction that really surprised me. Uh, one moment, she was she was a very, very um, uh, grief-stricken woman. 
um, crying and um, very, very vulnerable. And the next minute she sat bolt upright and she, her eyes glazed over. Um, they weren't focused. And she said in a very, very cold voice, it was his fault. Oh, my. And I said, whose fault was that? And she said, the doctor, of course, he should have known. So imagine I'm sitting there looking at a woman who's sat bolt upright with a stony face, cold. And so I said, um, should have known what? And she said, I had pleurisy and he should have known that. He should have known that and saved my baby. But he didn't. So I wished the same thing on him. And she said, but then... Um, he couldn't have a stillborn child, could he? So he should have lost an arm or a leg or something like that. Mm. And I sat in stunned silence listening to this and just did not know how to deal with it. Um, so I had to go away. Uh, I mean, this is just one example of several uh, of a similar nature, cold and uh, threatening in, in, in an emotional way. So I had to go away and research and read up on these things. And the, the first book that struck a chord with me was written by um, a Swiss psychiatrist by the name of Hans, Dr. Hans Nagli Osgord. And I picked up this book and straight away I had a rejection uh, against even looking inside it because I thought this is just not going to give me the answers I'm looking for. Dr. Palmer, I'm going to jump in here and uh, we will take a quick time out. We'll come back and we'll pick up on this point. And uh, you are listening to The Conspiracy Show. We're talking about the science of spirit possession with Dr. Terrence Palmer. Back with more of our conversation right after this. When in doubt, blame the government. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Terrence Palmer discussing the science of spirit possession. And you had a series of of difficult cases as a hypnotherapist where you kind of hit this wall. You you went away and you consulted this book. Hans Nagley Nagley, Osgore. Nagley Osgore. And... The moment you cracked it open, you just kind of felt like, well, this isn't going to get me anywhere. Just explain a little bit further what you meant by that. Well, the question I was asking, it was to, it was this business about cursing someone, wishing them ill will, and then something dreadful happens. Uh, apparently, the, the wife of this doctor had a stillborn. Yes. So that raised serious questions. How is this possible? Does a curse actually work? If a curse works, how is it carried from A to B? How does it find its target? These were the questions that were running around in my mind. So I was investigating witchcraft, demonology, spirit possession, and so on. And I came across this book by Hans Nagli Osgood. It was called Possession and Exorcism. Uh, and I thought, what what is a psychiatrist doing writing a book like this? But this book fell into my possession. And this is one of the the interesting things about this kind of work, what I've discovered is that if I have a serious question to ask, I always get the answer. The answer is given to me one way or another. And I've learned to respect that. It's almost as if the universe is, is answering my question directly. Right. You can call it God if you like. You can call it synchronicity, but it works. So I've got this book and I've looked inside it and I'm thinking, no, this can't be true. This can't be real. This can't be applied. But in this book, this psychiatrist gives um, a solution uh, to the problem. And it's he addresses um, he, he addresses the problem by assuming the possibility that this person may have a spirit within them. And he doesn't know whether it's the spirit of a dead person, an earthbound spirit or a demon, or an angel, or whatever it is. He can't see it, he can't hear it, he can't negotiate with it. So he, he's, he, he wrote a prayer that addresses all these scenarios. And he first of all reads the Lord's Prayer from Christian religion. And then he says to the possessing spirit, 
um, if you're human, you're dead. Um, if you're not human, then you have to go. Uh, and there's a detailed um, uh, prescription of how to deal with this. And I had no alternative to, to turn to, so I thought, oh, well, let's give it a try. <laughs> you know, let's, let's see what happens. So I contacted the, um, the husband of this woman and um, I said, uh, when you bring her to the next consultation, can you come into the consulting room with her? Because I'd like you to be there and witness what I say to her. So he said, OK, fine. And we sat down and um, I read from the Lee Osgood's book, I read the Lord's Prayer and I looked across at him and he looked at me as if, you know, what are you doing? And, and the woman started to writhe in her chair and get very, very uncomfortable. And then I carried on with the um, prescription from the book. And uh, after a few moments, uh, the, the dust settled, so to speak. And the woman went into um, a very, very um, emotional, uh, traumatic experience, floods of tears and, and uh uh, verging on the violent, and then she she got very very peaceful, went into a sort of half sleep like state, and was very calm. And her husband and I looked at each other, and raised their shoulders, and you know, with this quizzical look, as if to say, well, what the hell happened there? Yeah. But so it solved the problem. So that gave me my first insight into the possibility that this is real. At this point, I had to start thinking back through my own experiences, back to my childhood, back to my younger days as, as, as a soldier and uh, my early career and so on. And then I began to realise that I had encountered experiences before that were dismissed uh, out of hand, quite simply because of the uh, the education that we have. I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about friends, colleagues, um, family, um, we are um, educated in the modern scientific world to reject these ideas uh, from a very, very early age. So by the time we reach adulthood, we have a, uh, a clear mind, so to speak, that is not infected with ideas of, of um, spirits or angels or, or gods or anything else. Um, so I had to think back and, and then I began to realise that there were incidences where I'd been um, tapped on the shoulder to use a metaphor about these things and I realised that I had been ignoring these things all my life and they had validity I was then very very interested in discovering two things I needed to find a way to treat the people that were coming to me for help and I needed to find scientific validity for it. And I did. But is it fair to, to sort of describe that moment when you decided, OK, well, let's try this? I mean, there's a, a, a saying in, or an expression in, in sports. I don't know if you have it in England. It's called the Hail Mary Pass where it's kind of a, an American uh, football, the quarterback will, will throw this very long pass as the clock is winding down. He doesn't really expect anyone to catch it, but it's, it's like, at this point, what do I have to lose? Was this kind of, an, uh, kind of a Hail Mary pass? The way you describe it, I suppose it, it could apply, really, but um, no, it, it, it was, no, not really. It, it, it was a long process of this of this, of investigation and discovery. Um, I, I followed three avenues to try to to find an answer to this question. Um, I followed my scientific training in psychology using scientific method uh, to understand what was happening, and I discovered nothing in psychology, not mainstream psychology at all. And I could see that mainstream psychology and psychiatry were going off completely in the materialistic direction. That everything that you experience is according to the brain. And I uh, investigated that and I found that that is not true at all. And the other avenue I explored was to go and visit 
spiritualist churches and see how they did things, how they communicated with the spirit world. So I went back to the ideas and the research and the methods that Frederick Myers used over a hundred years ago and started putting them into practice and lo and behold, they worked. Hmm. And this woman, this the, the case of this woman who had suffered from yeah. debilitating depression for 16 years after a stillborn birth, the, the depression was completely gone after that? It cured her completely. And in fact, a, a few days, about two weeks after that, I just happened to be walking along the street one day and I bumped into her in the street and she invited me to her home and made me a cup of tea and said, thank you very much. <laughs> it's My life has changed. Emotions are uh, energetic. They have an energetic frequency. We live in a material world that's solid. It's actually condensed energy that operates at a very, very low frequency. And as you move up from the physical into the emotional and the mental and the spiritual, this, the vibrations change. It's like changing the frequency on, on a radio or television set, and you can access different channels. Now, um, extreme emotional distress uh, emits a powerful um, frequency charge. And now th this is where you need to use a little bit of imagination, but I've, I've gathered scientific evidence to support this hypothesis that I'm going to present to you, okay? Uh, as we go about our business as human beings, we are emitting an energetic charge. Uh, we have varying degree of um, frequency. Some people have a low frequency. They go through life um, morose, depressed, angry, um, and, and that attracts a certain type of person. All alcoholics attract each other. People who are drug takers attract each other. People who love to sing and dance attract each other. It's the business of like attracts like. Mm -hmm. It's what we call sympathetic resonance, okay? So when a person has an extremely powerful negative um, energetic discharge of emotion, it attracts the energetic resonance of beings that use that discharge uh, for their own sustenance. It's like a food to them. It's like plugging into an energy source. Uh, these life forms, often intelligent, complex, uh, they exist in other dimensions that are in parallel to ours on a daily basis, and I mean daily, every single day, I'm working with people who uh, suffer from these problems and and what we do uh, now i'm the scientist and i don't see or hear spirit but i work with people who do people who are mediumistic and i will connect with um spirit beings that you might call guides or light workers or um, beings of light they're from other dimensions um, you can call them angels if you like but they do exist they have intelligence in fact they have super intelligence and we work with these beings and we ask them to scan the frequencies and find out what's there interfering with the person and ask them to have the infection removed. And that's precisely how it works. We'll take another quick time out, come back and continue to delve into the science of spirit possession right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Stay with us. And we are back with Dr. Palmer. The Science of Spirit Possession. Uh, you talked about uh, synchronicity a little earlier. And mm -hmm. there's, a, I mean, I love serendipity and synchronicities, but here's a, a wonderful example. Uh, while you're sort of on this journey of discovery, uh, you're in a bookstore and you're, mm -hmm. appro you're, you're approached by, uh, I guess she's a, a, a sales associate, and uh, she's asking for help. Tell me about that story. What happens? Okay, she told me that um, she had she was experiencing unexplained anger. She'd be out with her friends socializing, and then suddenly she she had this irresistible feeling that she wanted to kill everybody, and it was really worrying her a lot. So she invited me to investigate uh, for her. So uh, I went to her home. And uh, to, to cut a, a long story short, as they say, one minute I'm sat there with a, a peaceful, intelligent, educated woman, and the next minute I'm uh, being 
stared at, <laughs> glowered at, by a very, very angry person who wants to kill me. Took me completely by surprise. I did not know how to deal with this at all. So it just reinforced the message I was getting that I need to learn how to deal with this. And that was when I decided to go away to find someone who understood these things, who could teach me. Um, and I, uh, I went to see a psychiatrist in London who'd been to the United States to be trained by uh, William Baldwin. Um, but he wasn't in a position to be able to teach me, so he referred me to a, a married couple who had also been to the United States, and they'd been trained by a psychiatrist called Irene Hickman. And they taught what they called the Hickman method. So I went along to their training, and the way it worked was that they we were invited. There were about six or seven of us on this training course. It lasted five days. And each of us was invited to write down the name of a person that we thought could possibly be helped by the method that was being taught. So I wrote down the name of the woman in the bookshop. And the idea was that you pulled a name out of the hat and that was the case that you were working on. Um, and it just so happened the name I pulled out of the hat was the same name as the woman in the bookshop. So I was given the opportunity to investigate using this method, um, this woman's unexplained anger. And what I found, I found myself being at one, it's the only way I can describe it, I became the possessing spirit of that woman. And I became this, the earthbound spirit of a North American Indian whose tribe had been decimated during the North American Indian Wars of the, of the 19th century. And he was still seeking retribution and revenge for the uh, genocide of his tribe of his tribe and I must confess I had I didn't know that uh, such rage could exist in the breast of a man and I experienced it firsthand it was it was traumatic it was profound but the experience for me was to be taken to be guided to the light where all spirits go when they leave where they're all spirits are supposed to go when they leave the body. Now, you can uh, reconcile this with religious teaching or not, uh, but this is a reality that I've discovered. Um, when the spirit, when the body dies, the conscious mind, the spirit leaves the body and it needs to return home to the light. If it doesn't go to the light, it remains earthbound and it lives a life of um, pain and suffering until it finds a release. And that was my training. And and we're talking this method. We're talking about spirit release therapy. Yes. Um, we're coming up on a on a break in just a, about a minute and a half here. But let's start talking about spirit release therapy. What that involves in a little more detail, and then we'll pick it up on the other side, so to speak. No pun intended. Um, so spirit <laughs> <laughs> spirit release therapy. How does it work? What 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 is the what is what is what are the protocols, if you will? Okay. Okay. Let me make. Uh, the distinction between two types here. Spirit release therapy is where the the practitioner is a therapist working face to face, one to one with the patient. As I was working the woman who was depressed, that I was being a therapist. Okay. Um, but remote spirit release, which was the method that was taught to me when I released the the American medicine chief to the light, that's done remotely where the subject is in another place. It could be many miles away. So there's a distinct difference. One is remote and one is face to face. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, why don't we leave it there? We'll take a time out, come back, and we'll, we'll continue to uh, delve into uh, spirit release therapy. And then I want to, uh, in the next hour, talk about a string of fascinating cases uh, that you worked utilizing um, SRT, we'll call it for shorthand. Back with more of my conversation with Dr. Terence Palmer, right here on The Conspiracy Show. The owners of the system are asleep. Now we can play. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. And we 
we are discussing a spirit release therapy with Dr. Terence Palmer on the line from lovely Kent, England. And um, you differentiated between uh, the remote spirit release technique and uh, the, the therapy, which sort of is conducted face to face. So tell me a little bit more about the sort of the remote aspect of the spirit release therapy. How do, what does that involve? Okay. Um, the big difference between the two is that the practitioner is not sitting, with remote therapy, the practitioner is not sitting in the same room face to face as the patient, as the subject. That person could be anywhere in the world. In fact, 50% of my clients are in, on the North American continent. Um, it's because the spirit is not of the material world. It is beyond time and space. So time and space are irrelevant. Uh, and this, this has scientific validity. This was investigated by the Russian neurologist Vasiliev um, in, uh, the 19, in the earlier 20th century, um, where he proved the scientific validity of telepathic hypnosis. So science knows all about this. It just, it just chooses to ignore it, okay? Uh, but it is very, very powerful. It does work. In, in fact, this very day I sat down with a client, and I'll explain to you how it works. It, it requires, there are three people in the team, okay? So you, ha you don't have a single therapist sitting in a room with a client which is the normal way of working, okay? You don't have that. You have a team of three people. You have the, the therapist, let's call it the facilitator, okay? Uh, I'm the facilitator, and the case has been brought to my attention, uh, the person's asking for help. So then I will contact my colleague, who is a medium. And a medium is a person who is able to communicate with the spirit world, okay? The third member of the team is the medium's guide, which is a spirit being. And the spirit being can, in fact, just recently we've been working with, because I teach this. I've got lots of students and trainee practitioners working with me, and I'm teaching them how to do this. So we're getting to know an awful lot of spirit guides. Our principal guide is... Uh, the last time he had uh, an earth life was 500 years ago in, in ancient China, and, and his name is Chen. And he's always with us. I'm sure he's listening to us now. All this It may sound absurd to a lot of people who are listening, but this is reality. Uh, so I will uh, connect on Skype with my colleague, uh, the medium, and I will say to my uh, medium friend, can you ask uh, the spirit guide to join us? And the spirit guide will come in. So there's three of us working. And then I will give the name, uh, the age, the gender, and the location of the patient. And the spirit guide will make the connection with the, the spiritual energy of that person. And then we will investigate what's wrong with that person and deal with it. So that's how the remote method works. Now, going back to the case of the, uh, the the sales associate you met in the bookstore, who had the uh, this rage, this anger, and yes. and you discovered th in conjunction with working with the the spirit guide uh, and the um, the medium that that this woman was possessed by the spirit of an Indian chief who was angry because of uh, the genocide that had taken place in in North America. Correct. Yes. And and so how did that case how was that case resolved? The earthbound spirit of the Indian um was taken to the light where his spirit should have gone when he died. And that was all done remotely? Yes, and in fact I I was privileged to experience uh, escorting him and going with him to the light and this was the moment this was the most moving experience of my entire life. Uh, it, I've never experienced anything before or since. But I'll tell you very, very briefly what happened. Um, under the direction of the instructor that was teaching us this method, um, all I could hear was a discarnate voice telling me um, what was happening, what to do. 
and he was talking to me uh, as the um, as I was possessed by the I, w- I was the Indian. I became my consciousness consciousness became integrated at one with his, like <laughs> like Spock's mind meld in Star Trek. Yes, you know? um, if, if if you want to get a handle on it, so I became at one with. With the Indian and and the the discarnate the voice of the instructor was saying to me, um, you have to go to the light where all spirits go uh, when the body dies, and he took me to the light and I could, uh, for as far as the eye could see, it was just white bright light. It didn't hurt my eyes, it, but it was bright light. And as far as the eye could see, to the left of my vision were thousands and thousands of Indian braves that had died in the North American Indian Wars. And to the right were all the soldiers and the settlers that were engaged in this conflict. And in a in an act of reconciliation and forgiveness, they, they came together uh, to, in forgiveness be, and recognized the futility and the stupidity of what had happened. And that was the most profound experience I have ever had. And in that in that moment, the the, the, the bookstore clerk was relieved of this oppression. Yes, I had I had dinner with her later. <laughs> And she was relieved, yeah. And, and it, did, works, it, it works instantly because it's beyond time and space. And did any of this resonate with her? In other words, did she, had she had sort of unexplained dreams or visions of, uh, uh, of Indians? Did any of this make sense to her? It made a lot of sense to her because she had been to North America. Um, she, she had long black hair. She was, I could see that there was a genetic link with... with, with um, North American indigenous peoples, um, and, and she held uh, she held her hair in, in the same sort of design plait that they use in some tribes. And she'd been to North America, and she had a um, a sympathy with with them. So there was the sympathetic resonance um, this, that she obviously picked up this. Um, the spirit of this North American Indian while she was there. And um, he, he felt that he could uh, connect with her. Uh, so he shared his anger with her. We've got about two minutes here till the top of the hour, and we'll continue on in the next hour discussing some more of these fascinating cases. But I, I wanted to get your, 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 your views on reincarnation because I'm wondering if spirit attachment... Uh, is often confused for reincarnation. In other words, someone believes they're having memories of a past life, but what they are having are the memories of the entity that is possessing them. It's an interesting question, and and it can be resolved quite easily, really. Would you like me to explain how it's resolved right now? Yes, please. We just ask the spirit guide, because the spirit guides have all the wisdom have all the knowledge we know nothing as human beings we are ignorant stupid we know nothing if you want an answer to the to the question you you ask those that have the knowledge and it's written in the bible have a look at the book of james um the epistle of james it says it in the first five chapters the uh, first five um verses if you seek wisdom ask god and you'll get the answer and it's true but but what do you think of that idea that that in many cases, all cases, some cases, that that what we we think we're remembering is a past life is actually a spirit attachment. We're it's it's that entity's life that we're living, not our previous incarnation. Well, it is a possibility, and if you if you need an answer to the question, you have to ask the question, and you will get the answer. Is this my past life? Is this a past life of someone else? Um, what is it? You do get the answer. It's ah. unraveled for you. So in your experience, it's not an either-or proposition, in other words? No, it could be anything. Right. It could, it could, yeah, it, any, any number of possibilities. Yeah. All right. Let's get uh, ready for the second hour. Dr. Terrence Palmer stays with us right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. From Toronto, Canada, Earth, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. On Zoomer Radio. 
Thanks for inviting me into your home. Long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' basement, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Hello to everyone listening in on our flagship station, Zuma Radio, AM 740, 96.7 FM here in Toronto. Hi to all of you tuning us in on one of our affiliates across North America, and howdy to those listening via the Zuma Radio and Conspiracy Show apps, those of you streaming us on zoomerradio.ca, and those listening via the YouTube channel, Strange Planet. Just a reminder, no live stream tonight. That returns next week. However and wherever you're listening, I bid thee the warmest of welcomes, and I thank you for your fine company. Before we get back to my conversation with Dr. Terrence Palmer on the science of spirit possession, a couple of announcements. First, it's time for our monthly draw for Patreon supporters. And this month's winner of Strange Planet merchandise is Rodney of Phoenix, Arizona. Congrats, Rodney. You've won a CD collection of my radio feature, Strange Planet, Volume 2. I'll get that out in the mail early next week. Now, this month's exclusive online chat with me on Discord for our whistleblower tier on Patreon is happening Thursday, June 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And the exclusive Google Video Hangout with me for Star Chamber Patreon supporters happens at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Again, Thursday, June 27th. To become eligible for the monthly merch draw or the exclusive online chats, go to patreon.com forward slash strange planet and consider becoming an official supporter. Now, I also want to remind you about my podcast, Conspiracy Unlimited, and new episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you haven't had a chance to listen, I strongly urge you to subscribe and have those new episodes uh, delivered to your desktop or your device Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and you can listen and subscribe at conspiracyunlimitedpodcast.com conspiracyunlimitedpodcast.com. We just uh, launched this. It'll be two years in December, and we are closing in on three million unique downloads. So I'm very excited and and pleased with its uh, progress. Next week on The Conspiracy Show, Dr. Mark Mirabello. He's an author and professor of history at Shawnee State University in the United States. And uh, he's appeared on the, uh, the History Channel discussing deadly cults on ancient aliens. And uh, he's also been uh, a guest on Coast to Coast AM. He's the author of a number of books, including The Odin Brotherhood, a nonfiction account of contact with an ancient brotherhood, and A Traveler's Guide to the Afterlife, The Cannibal Within, and uh, For Rebels and Outlaws. And again, Dr. Mark Mirabello will be with us for the full two hours next week. Now, let's get back to our discussion on the science of spirit possession. Dr. Terrence Palmer has a degree in psychology from Canterbury Christ Church University, a master's degree in the study of mysticism and religious experiences from Kent University, and he is the author of The Science of Spirit Possession. I wanted to uh, dive into some more uh, cases and, and, and your use of spirit release therapy. Uh-huh. Uh, there is a, the remarkable case of a, a, a young school girl you discovered who, who was confined to a wheelchair. Uh, and there was no sort of underlying medical reason why she had, she had lost the use of her legs. Talk to me about this case. Yes, this was one of my very earliest cases where I was able to um, uncover the, the link between... Uh, the power of fear um, in attracting negative entities. Um, in order to discover the, the reason why this, this young woman had lost the use of her legs, I used a, a hypnotic technique where she was able to access past memories. And it's a very, very simple process. And I used to, when I was doing one-to-one therapy as a hypnotherapist, I don't do that now because I just do the remote work. But um, a very, very um, common and easy way of uncovering the cause of an illness is to say to the person, right, on the count of three, you go to that time and place where this problem began. One, two, three, and you can click your fingers and and the patient goes there. And you ask them to describe to you what is happening. Now, when I did this with this young woman, she was just 15 years old, her mother was in the room. And despite 
the power of the suggestion. She was reluctant to tell me what she was experiencing. She was embarrassed. She felt shame. So I brought her out of the altered state, out of the trance, and I said, um, just give me an indication of what was happening at the time that everyone was aware of. And she said, I was in the back garden of my friend's house. We were playing games. She was about eight years old. And, um, and, and something happened that embarrassed her that she didn't want to talk about. And uh, so I had to get the mother to leave the room because she didn't want to speak in front of her mother. And it transpired that um, uh, a relative of her friend, an uncle, tried to molest her. Ah. So, so the intense fear, going back to what I was saying earlier about the, the energetic vibration of human emotions, this sends out a beacon. It, it, it's like an explosion of energy, of fear. And, and this attracts the, um, uh, the what we call dark force entity, a DFE, uh, an interdimensional species that feeds off that emotional energy. And that's what um, she was affected by. That's how, it, that's how it came to be attracted to her. And, and why would this DFE uh, manifest itself in her by through paralysis of her, her legs? What you need to try to consider is that these these interdimensional species they um, they need to sustain their existence off feeding off energy. So in order for it to maintain its attachment to her, it had to keep her in a state of fear. And that fear led to the paralysis. Yeah, well, it, that fear can affect you in all sorts of ways, can't right. it? Yes, yes. It, it, yeah, yeah. But that that was the key, and that was when I realised that the uh, uh, and I began to form a hypothesis. Then uh, my scientific mind started working, and I went to a professor of psychology uh, at Bangor University when I was doing my um, my research, and I suggested to him that all non-organic mental illness is caused by fear so if you think about it with the exception of brain damage or chemical damage to the brain yes. right yes interference with the normal function of the brain with the exception of that all other forms of mental illness are caused by fear mm. and i have been continuously um convinced of that in in all my work so when we are working in this field, I'm working with my colleagues I, and, and I'm teaching people how to do this. I say to them right at the beginning, fear is not allowed. It's not permitted. You cannot do this work if you harbor fear because fear will attract the dark forces to stop you working. It's that simple. And, and uh, how did you, I mean, if it's the, the spirit of uh, a, an earthbound soul, you direct it towards the light. If, yes. it's, if it's not, if it's some other type of this dark force entity, how yeah. do you exercise that? You just ask the spirit beings that work with this to take it away. And the moment this DFE left this girl's body, what happened? She could walk again. Did you witness, were you there to witness her getting up out of her chair? And taking no, those first steps? No, no, it took a couple of days for it a couple of days for it to settle in. Yeah. I mean, if, if you'd witness a miracle, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> if it happened like that. <laughs> and, but sadly, it doesn't. It depends on the person. Sometimes they can recover in a day, sometimes a few days. But, yeah, you, you always need to check back to see how the person's doing. As a scientist, I need to know that this method works. And that it's repeatable. Yes. Most importantly, as a scientist, right? That you have to yes. be able to repeat it. So uh, tell me about the teacher who had this impulse to electrocute herself. Oh, I bumped into her recently, actually. <laughs> In a shop. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that was a very, very interesting case. She, um, quite a detailed case, actually. It turned out that um, on investigation... We, we discovered that she had uh, an energetic resonance 
from a past life where she had been accused of being a witch. This was in the 15th century in Scotland. And she, we found her imprisoned in, in, in a prison in Scotland, awaiting um, to be hanged as a witch. Uh, but she was a healer. She's uh, like a lot of people, they have natural gifts of healing. But because of the persecution by the church in the Middle Ages, um, she was um, imprisoned as a witch. So in this life, she was reluctant to go into nursing, which was her first um, really preferred profession. So she took up teaching instead. OK, so the the the, the energetic resonance and it's beyond conscious memory, but there's something in within the spirit memory uh, that remembers these things. So she was a, a potential healer. Now, for people who are healers or potential healers, genuine spirit, um, genuine light workers, we are seeing by dark forces as the enemy. And this, this is a constant battle between light and dark. And you know, people and scientists may scoff at these ideas, but I have scientific evidence to support these hypotheses. People who work in this field are un under constant attack from dark forces that try to stop us from working. And this is what was happening to this woman. She had a, a, a demonic type creature with her that was uh, inducing her into the irresistible impulse to put her fingers in live electric light sockets so that she would expire. And she was fighting hard to resist it. So when we discovered what was causing it and removed it, and she was fine. Finally, I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the possession of a patient by an entity that was identified as Dark Samuel. Tell me about that oh, case. Yeah. <laughs> Dark Samuel. He was earthbound. He was um, the spirit of a person who had lived an earth life. He was a man who died. And in a previous life, he had... Um, possessed this person, the, the patient, the client, as, as a slave. Um, and when he died, he didn't want to relinquish his possession. So he remained earthbound and kept her um, to himself. He, he was working hard to prevent her from living a normal life, having normal relationships. She couldn't marry anyone. She couldn't maintain a relationship. Um, and, because he was preventing it. So uh, and, and what was interesting about him was that he was so dark, I just called him Dark Samuel. Um, and uh, when we release someone to the light, what we normally do is ask for someone who loves them to come and collect them and show them the way, someone who's gone before. Um, and that usually works rather well. But in, in Dark Samuel's case, there was no one who loved him, no one who went before, who wanted to, <laughs> who hmm. wanted to escort him. So this presented a bit of a problem. So I thought, well, what do we do now? And then it, again, in answer to that question, what do we do now? If you send a, a serious question out to the universe, you will get an answer. And uh, in answer to my plea for help, um, one of the archangels came, I think it was Gabriel, came uh, to escort him and uh, Dark Samuel started whimpering and showing signs of fear. And I said, what's the matter, Samuel? He said, Gabriel, come to get me. I can't argue with him, so I better go. <laughs> hmm. It was quite uh, quite funny. What do you say to the, the, the skeptics who might suggest that this um, this effect that you're having or that your team uh, is having through spiritual release therapy is is an example of the placebo effect. Yes, it's an interesting idea, isn't it? A placebo itself is an interesting idea because what placebo actually demonstrates is the power of belief, doesn't it? Yes. That's all it is. Placebo is the power of belief. And yes, there could be... Um, an element of that attached to this method. If a person believes that what you're doing is going to heal them and it works, yeah, it could be the power of placebo. 
In order to test against that, what we do is, um, and this is where the scientific method comes into its own, when I receive a request for help from a client, um, I don't tell the medium anything about the details of the case. The medium has no preconceived ideas. It's just another case, and it could involve anything. Uh, we work on the case, uh, we deal with the problem that's presented, and then I will leave it for 24 hours and wait for the, um, the intervention to start having an effect, okay? Um, what I, my favourite uh, procedure is to do nothing, is just to wait for that client to contact me and say, what, have you, what did you do and when did you do it? Because I'm feeling so much better. Hmm. So if the client doesn't know when the procedure is being conducted, it can't be placebo, can it? Right, right. And you have cases, or have you had cases, where the patient, if I can use that term, they don't believe, and yet it works anyway. Yes, many of our cases are brought by family members on behalf of their loved ones. Uh, extreme examples of this are where you have a parent who has a, uh, a, a son, usually a son, sometimes a daughter, who's been sectioned, um, uh, is in psychiatric hospital or in prison, but generally in psychiatric hospital on uh, antipsychotic medication so that they're, they have no conscious awareness of what's going on. You can't communicate with them. You can't even reach them physically. So, um, and when we work on cases like this, um, it doesn't matter what the person, the patient believes or doesn't believe because they are consciously non-functioning anyway. But when they recover and the psychiatrists have no other course of action than to release them from hospital, um, how do you explain that? You know, what's fascinating is that the field of psychology, and I'm gathering that, you know, the vast, vast majority do not believe um, in this. Mm -hmm. uh, th they would probably even deny the existence of the soul, yet yes. yeah. the, the root word of psychology, psyche, literally yeah. means soul in Greek. Yes, it does, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, because you, were, you came to America and you worked with... Uh, another member of uh, the um, the Spirit Release Foundation, and you were working with convicted uh, spousal abusers, wife beaters, and sexual abusers. Yes. yes. Uh, tell me about your work in, in in America, working with these these convicts. Well, I was introduced to a gentleman who had been appointed by the court to as a facilitator to help these convicted criminals. Um, uh, adapt and change their their behaviour. They were appointed, they were ordered by a court of law to attend to his um, rehabilitation program for a year. And he had about 10 or 12 people that he was working with. And um, I asked him if he'd be interested in learning something that would help him with his work. And he said, well, yes, of course, I would. So um, we, I taught him the method, introduced him to the method, and then asked him to uh, ask his cohort of, um, of uh, people that he was working with if any of them would like to volunteer for this method. And there were three or four volunteers who said they'd like to try it. And, of course, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't know when it was going, going to happen. They just went about their business normally. But we worked on um, three or four cases, and and, and the, the difference that they, these people felt was reported. So the, um, the facilitator of this program um, was, was absolutely amazed. He said, this is wonderful. This, we have to use this. So he went to his employer, the Pennsylvania State um, judiciary or whatever the name of the organization was that appointed him as, as rehabilitation manager he went to them and said this is the method can we um, employ it and they said 
Well, this certainly sounds very, very interesting. It, 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 it needs to be looked at in greater detail. Uh, he asked permission if we could conduct a clinical trial under controlled conditions, and they said, yes, you can, providing it is supervised and managed by an established scientific institution. And I thought, great, this is wonderful. This, now this is back in 2002, 2003, around about that time. I said, this is wonderful, fantastic. Uh, but we're still looking for that scientific institution that's willing to take on the challenge. We haven't found it yet. They're still too scared to test it. Hmm. And uh, was there any recidiv uh, uh, recidivism with any of the, the cases that you worked? I can't answer that question because I had to come back, back to UK. And in fact, I was... Um, in the middle of my studies at the time, and um, I, I really couldn't follow it up. And, and this is, again, the reason why we need a scientific institution to look into this, because I'm, I'm just a, a one-man researcher. I'm, um, I'm, I'm teaching other people how to do it. I've got a caseload that I'm working with. I'm gathering research, and I'm showing how to integrate clinical practice with research and teaching uh, but I'm still only one man. This this really takes um, a department in a scientific institution. What I'm really looking for is a psychiatric hospital or a clinic that has access to patients with common problems, like hearing voices, for example, where these uh, methods can be tested under controlled conditions. I can't possibly do it alone. All right, we'll take another quick time out, come back and uh, continue our discussion on the science of spirit possession with Dr. Terence Palmer right here on The Conspiracy Show. Follow the truth. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio, AM 740. And we are back with Dr. Terence Palmer, The Science of Spirit Possession, now in its second edition. And uh, that is available uh, through the publisher. And uh, that is Cambridge Scholars Publishing. We were talking earlier about your work with uh, convicts, uh, spousal abusers, wife beaters, uh, sexual abusers. I'm wondering about... I don't know if you've worked with uh, people convicted of homicide, but when you look back sort of historically at some of the more high-profile uh, murderers, serial killers, uh, uh, people like John Wayne Gacy, uh, for example, in America, or uh, Mark David Chapman, not a serial killer, but um, the, 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 the man who killed John Lennon, based on interviews with these people, what are your thoughts about the possibility that serial killers, murderers, are affected by spirit, uh, possession, or oppression? Well, I've given this an awful lot of thought. In fact, when I returned from the United States, when I had been working with those um, wife beaters and sexual abusers, um, th these ideas were uppermost in my mind. And I came back and I, I watched a television program on UK television. Um, there was an American author being interviewed about her book, Helen Morrison, My Life Amongst Serial Killers. Uh, so I bought, I got a copy of the book and I read it. And uh, as I was reading it, certain passages jumped out at me and demanded my attention. And I, I um, cited them, I made a note of them. And I put together an article that was entitled um, Serial Killers, Serial Rapists and Paedophiles. Are they evil people? Are they psychologically disturbed? Or are they possessed? Now, um, this was uh, an article that gave me my introduction to the university where I did my uh, PhD, because that, that was my um, key, my introduction, if you like. Um, and what was interesting is that when uh, when I presented this paper at a conference in Bangor, the conference was attended primarily by anthropologists with an interest in field studies with ethnic minority groups and traditional religions. So this idea 
of criminals being possessed by demons went completely over the heads. It, it was as if it, it just wasn't noticed at all. And that that article, that paper has never been published in a journal. I'm still sitting on it. But it gave me the, the idea. And when reading through Helen Morrison's book, it, it's blatantly obvious to me um, when you read that with this knowledge in the back of your mind, it's, it's blatantly obvious that when a killer says, um, God told me to do it, or the demon shouted at me to go and kill these people, that it, it is not just mental illness. There's a facet of that, yes, of course, because the person has lost their ability to exercise their free will. So you could call that mental illness if you like. But in, in more recently, I visited the United States about three years ago by invitation um, to a group of people in Michigan that wanted to learn these techniques from me. And as soon as I arrived, um, the head of the organization said to me, we've just had an incident locally. Uh, a, a, an Uber taxi driver has just been uh, arrested for killing six people in Kalamazoo County. Do you think this has got anything to do with spirit possession? I said, well, let's find out. So I sat down with uh, with a group of people. Uh, there were a couple of really good mediums there. We were testing the, the method, how it worked. And this was a case that we were presented with where we could test the method. We were given the name of the uh, taxi driver. And we sat in circle. And I asked the medium to connect with him. And he was in jail. And then, and, and this is recorded, it's on YouTube, you can watch this, it's called The Kalamazoo Killer, and I had a conversation with the spirit entity that induced him to kill six people. My word. So the answer is yes. And the uh, the accused, uh, in, in this case, what happened? Did he, did he notice? Uh, well, he's regarded as mentally ill, uh, he's guilty of a crime. Uh, was he sane at the time uh, that he committed it? I don't know. If I presented this case at a conference in, in the UK at a university a couple of years ago where we had a discussion about the, the legal implications of this, but it was a discussion between psychiatrists and theorists. Um, uh, I don't really know what the outcome of the case was, but we can only assume that he's... Um, I don't know what the sentence is in Michigan for killing six people. Is it the death sentence or is it lifelong imprisonment? But I should imagine that um, his plea that the devil made him do it fell on deaf ears. So, I mean, obviously, this is very controversial to say the least, because then it calls into question the whole idea of personal responsibility uh, yes. in, in criminal action. So yes. speak to that yes. if you could. Yes, very, very tricky. Um, very difficult. Um, when a person is possessed by uh, a very, very powerful and determined and highly intelligent spirit, it's very difficult to to resist that. So a person who is weak-willed or vulnerable in some way uh, is more likely to succumb. Uh, a person who is strong-willed and has a, a very, very powerful, strong sense of self would be able to defy that and beat that off. So, yeah. But then... Is, is it right to punish someone who's vulnerable? They're being punished anyway by, by the by the possessing entity. It's yeah, it's a very very tricky area, and I can understand. And I've spoken to lawyers about this. I've spoken to top lawyers about this, and discussed this. Um, and the general consensus is that it's too tricky for the legal profession to even consider. Is is a spirit possession or oppression always precipitated by some sort of trauma to that person to make them vulnerable? Uh, I would hesitate to use the word always, but there is a powerful indication that would suggest yes. Can it be physical or emotional? Yeah, it can be physical or emotional. Yeah, the, the most vulnerable people are, pe are children who are abused in childhood. So people, young children who are exposed to satanic ritual abuse, um, uh, and I've met them, we've, we've, we've had clients who've suffered this, 
And those that come through it and survive turn out to be extremely powerful, very strong people uh, for being survivors. Of course, there are many that don't survive. They commit suicide. Who else is vulnerable? Uh, you mentioned uh, children who are victims of abuse. What about uh, drug and alcohol addicts? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, it, the cases that I deal with, every one of them's recorded. They're recorded in two ways. One statistical um, and the other is audio visual um, when we are uh, communicating on the case. So these cases can be studied uh, statistically when the cohort's big enough uh, and they can be studied phenomenologically with qualitative discourse analysis. Um, and what we're finding is that a very, very high proportion of cases uh, had vulnerability because of alcohol and drug abuse. It, it, can it be kind of a chicken and an egg type scenario, though? Because does the alcohol or drug abuse open that person up to an oppression or does the oppression feed that addiction? A bit of both, really. Um, I mean, um, I'll tell you where it's dangerous. Um, it's, it's like a self-reinforcing cycle. Uh, a person can suffer a bereavement, and, all, uh, and we all suffer bereavement. We all lose loved ones and friends, you know, and, and grief is a human condition that we all experience. But someone who is unable to accept a loss and goes into a deep, desperate depression may find uh, self-medication with drugs or alcohol a relief, okay? But the moment that substance is put into the body, it depletes the power of the protective aura around us. And that gives, that is the vulnerability that is then penetrating. Imagine that you've got this aura around you. It's like a shell that protects you from infection, from spiritual dimensions. If that aura is perforated, becomes weak, then it's like the skin on your body protects you from insect bites, doesn't it? Mm, uh, indeed. And that infection, uh, and you have an immune system that fights off the infection if it gets penetrated. The spiritual body is very similar. It has this outer skin uh, that is um, depleted with any kind of chemical that's, that's put into the body, and that can include uh, all manner of drugs, not just recreational drugs, but medicines as well. So if a person gets depressed, goes to the doctor, gets antidepressant, it depletes the immune system and the aura, and it makes them vulnerable to spirit interference. So it doesn't help the problem at all. It just makes it worse. Self-reinforcing cycle. We'll take another quick time out. Come back uh, with more on the science of spirit possession with Dr. Terence Palmer. Stay with us. Don't be afraid. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio, AM 740. Welcome back. Dr. Terence Palmer stays with us as we continue to discuss the science of spirit possession. And let me read you a definition of spirit release therapy from the second edition of the book. Spirit release therapy is a term that is used by some practitioners, but not all, to describe a treatment modality that has evolved from the pioneering clinical experience of medical practitioners, psychiatrists, and clinical psychologists who have encountered patients with illnesses that have not responded to traditional psychotherapy or psychiatric methods. Such pioneers have treated them successfully using their own intuition and by responding to the expressed needs of the patient and those spirit entities that are encountered in dialogue rather than treating them according to predetermined theories and the beliefs and assumptions of the therapist. Spirit release therapy could therefore be described as a person-centered or perhaps a soul-centered therapy. Uh, Terence, I wanted to ask you about schizophrenia because you had mentioned that uh, based on your, your research, virtually all, I believe you refer to it as all non-organic um, psychological afflictions mm -hmm. are are caused by a spirit attachment oppression but w what about schizophrenia well you can include that of course um, but let me correct you first of all uh, what I did say was that 
all non-organic um, illnesses, mental illnesses, are caused by fear. Ah, right. And and fear is the attractant for a lot of uh, interdimensional species that feed off that negative energy. Uh, fear is just one of those negative energies. Anger is another one. Anger and rage will attract um, uh, such entities. But yes, uh, taking schizophrenia. Now, I'm not a medically trained doctor and I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm not qualified to comment on psychiatric diagnoses. But my understanding as a psychologist is, uh, and my experience of working with spirit entities, is that schizophrenia is a label given to certain mental illnesses by people who really don't understand what the real problem is. So it's a label to mask um, lack of knowledge, really, in my personal opinion. So very often we'll, we'll get a case referred to us by a family member of someone uh, who's in hospital, usually a, a son or a daughter, but sometimes a mother. We had a, a mother recently referred to us by a daughter who'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia by the medical profession. And when we investigated, we found that she was afflicted with um, non-human interdimensional creatures that were feeding off her vulnerability. And once they were removed, then she was re returned to normal cognitive functioning. Uh, what happens when a person is diagnosed with having some sort of a an organic brain disorder, brain disease, and but it's misdiagnosed, and it is, in fact, based on fear, as you say. Mm -hmm. And that person is given uh, drugs, which seem to mask the problem. Yes. Uh, in some cases, it seems to, to alleviate symptoms. How does that work? Well, let me tell you that removing the um, interdimensional life forms that, that use this vulnerability, that's the easy part. Okay, cleaning up the spirit is the easy part. The difficult part is getting psychiatry to acknowledge that the drugs are not doing any good at all and, and to have that person released from the medication. That's the hard part. But the effect of, uh, if a person has a, an attachment, what mm -hmm. are the effects of the medication on that attachment, if any? The medication doesn't affect the attachment. The medication affects the brain of the, of the patient. Uh, the medication affects the cognitive functioning of the person and, and weakens their, um, their, their resistance to spiritual infection. Um, this is, and this is a big problem for us because we, I don't want to be seen as negatively challenging the medical profession. What I want to try to do is to say to medicine and psychiatry, uh, what we have to offer here is adding value to medicine. So when you, when you uh, take a person into hospital who's showing signs of psychotic behavior and hearing voices, consider this as well, not just load them up with drugs and, and hope for the best because that's not going to work. Consider this possibility. Work with us to, to find the best practice for treating this person rather than just giving them drugs and not considering anything else. This is my message to psychiatry. I don't want to go to war with psychiatry. I want to help psychiatry. One last time out, we'll come back and finish up with Dr. Terence Palmer, The Science of Spirit Possession. Stay with us right here on The Conspiracy Show. This is no place for the naive or the faint-hearted. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serra from Zoomer Radio. Where there's smoke, there's The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serra from Zoomer Radio. We're talking about uh, psychological uh, diseases, afflictions. What about the advancement of neuroimaging? Uh, what, if anything, has that contributed to, to, to your area of research? Okay, neuroimaging is, uh, is useful for 
illustrating what happens to the brain when a person is having an experience. Now, I'm not an expert on neurology or neuroimaging at all, but in my book, I have referenced experiments that have been conducted uh, using uh, people who have the gift of automatic writing. Now, automatic writing is a form of spirit possession where the the person uh, goes into an altered state of consciousness, into a trance, and the spirit controls the hand and uses it to write. And this is very, very well known um, in, um, in, in research methods in investigating spirit possession. And again, it's not common knowledge. It's not widely known. It's get very, very quiet. But there are neuroimaging techniques that can show what happens in the brain when a person is engaged in automatic writing. And it's, um, it, it's well worth a read because it's, the outcome is quite surprising. What it shows is that contrary to what you may think, um, uh, when, a person, when a person's hand is being used in automatic writing, uh, there's very, very little activity in the brain. It's resting. Being ah, quiet. interesting. So and, and, the spirit is using it without conscious effort of the person that owns the brain. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering if there's been any experiments with neuroimaging and mediums who are uh, in con communicating with spirit guides. Now, that's an interesting question, and I'd love to be able to answer that question that question by engaging in research to investigate that. So I'd, I'd love to hear from someone who has the equipment <laughs> and the resources to co to uh, collaborate with me on answering that question. I'd love to investigate that because I, I have daily access to lots and lots of mediums who do this work. Talk to me about quantum theory and in your area uh, or your field of expertise and what has uh, particularly, you know, the three sort of tenets of quantum theory, what has that contributed to your understanding of spirit possession, spirit oppression? Okay, so I have to use layman's language here because, I, again, I'm not a, a quantum physicist. Um, I've only investigated this from uh, my research reading um, of the experts. Um, but what it does for me, it enables me to reconcile the the fact that I experience on a daily basis that the work I do and the effect it has on people is beyond time and space. So we have the um, the principle of non-locality, which is now firmly established in quantum physics, and and that for me gives gives us uh, a valuable and valid introduction to the possibility that. Um, quantum physics has a lot of the answers that we've been looking for in this area. I'd like to to ask you about the connection. When we're talking about an earthbound uh, spirit who <coughs> attaches to someone, mm -hmm. how, I mean, is there uh, a connection between a violent and sudden death uh, and an attachment? In other words, if a person dies under violent circumstances... Is that person more likely to attach to some living soul? Yes, they are. Um, we've had several cases where an earthbound spirit is um, remains earthbound because of a sudden death in in a motorcycle accident or a car accident, or on the battlefield. Um, we've had earthbound spirits attached to people where they've just been in in the environment where an accident has happened and the spirit finds itself out of the body is confused doesn't know where to go uh, but is attracted to a passerby because they just need comfort um, uh, if a child is suddenly killed or if a child dies in hospital they remain earthbound they will attach to a person who has a warm and compassionate nature because they're looking for a mother figure. Um, if an alcoholic uh, dies and finds himself still uh, earthbound, he will attach to uh, a still living alcoholic. So there's a sympathetic resonance 
that cause it's like a mag magnetism that attaches the spirit. Now we've had some earthbound spirits who've been killed in a war zone. We had a, a family, a, a woman and two children, who got bombed into oblivion in um, uh, during the Bosnian conflict, and a, a, a soldier that was serving there at the time. Um, picked her up uh, so to speak and, and we worked with him he'd actually been suffering from hearing voices for 23 years under psychiatric diagnosis of schizophrenia and PTSD and came to us uh, it's recorded it's on YouTube you can watch it it's all about hearing voices the soldier that had uh, a family attached to him that were blown up in the street um, all, all kinds of things happen that enable an earthbound to attach to a person. Is it possible to have a positive attachment? Yes. Uh, a, a very common earthbound attachment is where a loved one has died, uh, but the, the person who's died is reluctant to leave their family and wants to stay with them. And they attend their own funeral and and such. Um, and uh, similarly, you have the family that are such in such grief that they can't let go of their loved one who's died, and that causes them to remain earthbound. And how many of us? I mean, I don't know if you have a handle on this. Uh, maybe there's been polling done, but how many? How many of us throughout our lifetime? are likely to suffer some sort of even ephemeral uh, attachment. Uh, you know, it may come and it may go all on its own. Well, I would, I would suggest all of us can be affected in some way, in one way or another. I mean, as human beings, we are vulnerable to infection from all kinds of things, aren't we? You can catch a cold, you can... You can, you can pick up an infection from another person. If you, if you sleep with the wrong person, you can get a sexually transmitted disease. In fact, we had a case recently of a woman who had lain with a man who had been infected with uh, what you would call, perhaps call a, uh, a sexual demon, a succubus, incubus, and, it, and he passed it on to her. So...